combat journalism is the profession that's in charge of shaping the public opinion. Independent journalism may be perceived as the new form of journalism which has arisen from the changes in the working conditions that different professions share nowadays, but also from the transformations within the realm of media caused by the internet revolution and the new technology along with the changing status of information itself. How to deal with preconceived assumptions or how to make an assumption? What is the difference between mainstream media and local newspapers or those that function within a specific activist or professionalized community? What is it like being a foreign journalist in Ukraine in our conversation with Chris Scott, an independent journalist from Canada, we tried to outline some of the particularities, habits, and conditions which define independent journalism, trying to analyze the work of a journalist in global and historical perspective. Could you tell me a bit about yourself, your professional path, and what has shaped your experience as a journalist? Yeah, well, I'm, a, I'm about 43 years old now, so I've taken this sort of an uncharacteristic path through life. I studied languages and literature in university, wanted to become a uh, writer, also was involved in a certain amount of student activism and later environmental activism. And partly out of my own curiosity, I've traveled to different countries that have been in crisis, sometimes just to understand what's going on. And I sort of like doing that. I like interviewing people, asking questions, but I'm what was going on is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more gray zones, a lot more dynamics at play, but I was actually getting the information. I found what I was reading in the papers afterwards was too simple. I had already been to the post-Soviet post Union, I'd already, I had already learned some Russian in university, and when I heard about the crisis happening in Ukraine in 2014, I eventually decided it was important for me to go there for, to see for myself. And so I came here to Kiev in the spring of 2014. I was here in April and May. Went back and talked about that in Canada. And then eventually I decided to try to be a freelance journalist and sort of make more of a career out of it. Do you write for some big publishing houses or do you prefer local media? Lately I've tried to talk more and get a message out to to mainstream magazines, the magazines say most Canadians or most uh, most people international will read. So I published on Al Jazeera on their website, on the English website. They have an Arab website, Arabic language website as well. I published in the uh, Toronto Star, which is one of the Canadian papers, and McLean's, which is a Canadian magazine. Because obviously you have more of an impact. And you, whether you're intending to or not, you certainly affect public policy more if you're actually getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of readers versus a few hundred. If you're writing specifically for activists, they tend to have their own job, and then they tend to have a lot of their assumptions. I mean, some of which are very, in some cases, good, because there are a lot of assumptions that the mainstream press have too. They assume that, you know, that basically the capitalism works, that if the rich or the top 1% are getting rich and creating employment, it's good for everyone else. They assume that our countries are more or less democratic. There are a lot of just assumptions that Canada, for example, is a benevolent force in the world. We have this image of ourselves as not like the Americans that go into war, we do peacekeeping. Activist papers have their assumptions too, even though I would agree with some of the activist analysis, I mean, personally, my own skepticism about, say, free market capitalism and so on. A lot of activists may not be interested in the detail of what's going on. And the mainstream papers want to take hand doing good things. They don't the details. Activist papers may want to take hand of doing bad things. And they don't want to look at the details. And so it's interesting and perhaps a challenge, and I think it makes me a better journalist, to talk to people who are have a wide set of assumptions, wide sort of slice of the population, and try to explain things to them in words that they can actually understand. It's interesting, especially when we talk about the situation in Ukraine, I have to say, a lot of the mainstream Canadian press, obviously, see the main story of Canada is that Ukrainians want to be like us, they want to live like us. Of course, everyone wants to live like us, they have the same values as Canadians, and it's just what they're showing them back, and they have to, like, you know, help them face off this new Hitler that's basically going to just take over Europe. And then the left-wing press, interestingly enough, they're confused, I would say, partly because they just haven't done what I thought. haven't come to Ukraine and see what's actually happening on the ground. So they basically assume that Canada has this plot to encircle Russia and that Ukraine is just part of that. So I would say that both the left-wing press, which is, you know, fairly small, and the right-wing press are 
talking about Ukraine, but they're not really interested in Ukrainians. They're interested in Ukraine like as a, a pawn on a chessboard. And so being a journalist who wants to go and ask questions and doesn't just assume that one side is right and one side is wrong really helps me in a situation which is as complex as, as Ukraine is right now. Yeah, that's precisely my next question. How did you describe your experience in Ukraine? And why did you find it interesting? What particularities did you find out or discover here? I guess maybe I'll start with the time I came here. I spent five, six weeks here in 2014. So after my done, I wasn't here for any of the fighting, but I came and... You mean in the square? Yeah, I wasn't in the square. I left before the, I guess you could say, the war started in earnest. So I went to Donetsk at the time they had the referendum there, and I was surprised how easy it was to access. This was right at the beginning of May. And that was very bizarre. At one point, I sort of got arrested, if you want, or detained by like a separatist gunman who basically then took me into the building uh, that they were occupying and said, you have to give this guy a press pass. I mean, I was there as a journalist, and you know, I was there to write stories, but basically, you have to give this guy a press pass because he's going around, he's snooping, he's asking questions, and like someone's going to get mad and shoot him. Of course, he said this very quickly in Russian. I'm not sure if they thought that I would understand it, but I got a press pass. But no, I never saw any active fighting in Ukraine, which is certainly means I don't have the whole picture, I guess you could say. But I came here in April. I saw there were still like there were still pieces of blockades on the square, still walls of bricks. There was a smashed out uh, big police truck. And there were, you remember, obviously, there were all these um, groups of civil society. There were these cabins that they had basically set up on the square. And what was interesting is Again, people expected, I'm not sure what people expected necessarily in the West to hear, but I started talking to some of the different groups and said, what do you want? I mean, I had a quick talk with someone from right sector. It was kind of interesting, a few odd conversations. I asked them about specific things, like not just, okay, do you hate Russia, do you like whatever this? I said, look, I mean, do you think Ukraine should have, like, nuclear reactors? I mean, I just thought if you're really like starting and you are the government now, if you sort of taken over and say, we've built this like vibrant civil society, and say, well, okay, now that you have like an influence in your country, how are you going to run it? So I started asking all kinds of questions that I thought were important. I mean, maybe also from like, you know, prism of a Canadian activist, what we would worry about, you know? Obviously, I asked about pensions. I asked about what they, how they wanted to change the laws and so on. Okay. So I started getting this sense of what people had been demonstrating for. A lot of people had come to my dog for many, many different reasons. It started with the students demonstrating for the 